Good morning, London. Nice to see you all today. Um, Gabino and I are very excited and thrilled to be here. Not once, not twice, but this will be our third time headlining FinTech Live right here in the heart of London. So thank you for having us. I'm going to do my little annual shout out to our great friends at BizClick Media and uh, FinTech Magazine. Uh, you may have heard me say it before, and I'll say it again. If you want to know the latest in FinTech news and finance, definitely give these guys a like and a follow. We share our own personal stories as well as breaking news from Sapphire with FinTech Magazine. I'm sure our peers in the industry do the same, so give them a follow. I think it'd be worth your time. So a quick round of applause for BizClick Media and FinTech Magazine. So uh, change. It's coming for all of us. It's inevitable. There's nothing you're going to do to stop it. You just got to learn to embrace it and maybe prepare for that change. So I'm going to share a little story about myself personally and how I had to reckon with that situation once in my life. Um, it was many years ago before I got into this current career. Uh, I decided to drop out of college, get into the workforce, and uh, dabble in a couple other jobs. But I found myself being very persuasive and having an affinity to sales. Um, although I did not have a four-year degree, I thought it was quite risky to get into B2B sales with those large sales quotas. You know, there might not be a lot of job stability in a, a role like that. Uh, so I decided to get my feet wet first in retail sales, and I took a job at a company called Electronics Boutique. You may not know that name, but you may know the name that bought them, which is GameStop. You guys heard of GameStop, I'm sure. So yeah, that was me working at a video game store, starting as a lowly part-time sales rep, and uh, my hiring manager and I uh, got promoted, moving up inside the company ranks, where I got to a store manager, district manager level. And uh, eventually, my boss had a new boss, and that new boss fired him. And he wasn't going to promote me because I was of the old regime. And uh, instead, they promoted a peer of mine, which I had friendly competition with over the years. And, uh, but I did not know they had a deep-seated resentment for me and made my life a living hell. They wrote me up for all kinds of stupid things, uh, even though I had great performances going on. And I, it's not like I had recourse to complain to upper management. He was well-connected at the executive level of this company. So um, I just put blinders on and said, hey, if I just perform well and do what I've been doing over the years, um, they'll see me for the worth that I am and, and the, you know, the numbers I bring for the company. I'll be fine. And I was in self-denial. And so six months later, the inevitable happened, and I was fired. I never got to fire you. But <laughs> uh, the brotherly love, you got to love that, right? So um, in that situation, though, uh, it, it was humiliating, uh, very humbling. Um, but at the same time, I didn't realize it then. It was probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. I probably wouldn't be here today if that didn't happen. It rebirthed me to the man I am today. But I did learn one major thing from that whole experience is I didn't have to go through a culture shock or cold turkey situation because uh, it was unstable for about a good six months before I landed on my feet. Um, I could have prepared myself more in advance of that. I saw it coming. I was just in self-denial. And that's kind of the theme of what we're going to be talking about today because change is coming to the world of finance. So uh, boo-hoo, depressing story about Steve. Everyone knows I'm the smarter twin, so let me give you an example, a story, if you don't mind, on my side of how change came to us and how you can take advantage of it. So around the same time, our father had his own business, wasn't doing so well, uh, eventually went out of business, but at the time it was still struggling. So both Steve and I took on multiple jobs, and it was the hourly wage, right? How many hours you spend, how much you get paid, right? And I thought to myself, I could kill myself working more hours, or I can work smarter. And so I decided to look for commission sales. And at the time, this is the late 1990s, I found commission sales of all places at Macy's. You all know Macy's, but this is not Macy's of today. This is the Macy's of the 1990s. The brand name carried a lot more weight, like Neiman and Marcus and Nordstrom's. And I was selling men's suits, OK? Now, believe it or not, you can make a career out of selling men's suits, and I believe people in Nordstrom's, the salespeople there, are able to do, that, to do that still today. And the normal playbook is the brand name Macy's would get customers into the store. You just stand in one place, and customers will randomly bump into you, and you show them suits, and then you sell to them. 
right? Uh, while I was there, I created a relationship with each of my customers, and I'd always ask them, hey, would you mind being on a mailing list so I can let you know about upcoming sales? Now, there's a lot of young people in this room, and I'm a lot older than I look, but this is the 1990s. The internet just started, okay? There isn't smartphones. There is no Facebook. There is no Twitter, okay? So I'm physically writing down on a piece of paper, like scrap paper, people's names and addresses. And then I went home, and I created a computer program to automate creating personalized letters, not emails, physical letters that get printed out with people's names. I know it doesn't sound novel now, but back then, no one got a personalized letter with their name written out. And I also, the program printed out their addresses on every envelope, okay? And then I personally signed each one. And then I attached the publicly available sales that Macy's was having that week into the envelope with my personalized letter, letting them know that come here with this letter and ask for me and I will help you with this sale. Okay. There were lines of customers coming in every week and my coworkers wanted to have some of them, but they were like, no, 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 we're here with this letter. We're waiting for Gabino because he sent us a note. He let us know about this. Now, before I employed this technique, I was meeting about 70% of my quota. So if you're not in sales, you need to know that in commission sales, at least in retail, you're on a draw, so you actually owe money back to the company in sales. All right, so I'm not making up. But after this technique, I was consistently over 500% of my quota. Okay, and I knew that because the store manager had told the entire store and asked people to emulate what I was doing. The idea here, guys, is that you can actually embrace change, put your hands on the steering wheel, and control your destiny. So why am I sharing this story? Why are we sharing these stories with you? It's certainly not to sell you men's suits. It's certainly not to tell you to submit an application to GameStop to be a store manager at a video game store. Okay? It's the fact that there is change happening in finance, and everyone in this room should be aware of it. There's a term, and if you don't know it, I'll explain it to you. It's called T plus 2. Okay? T for the trade plus two for 48 hours, two days after the trade. What does that mean? It means when you buy Apple shares today, the banks don't have to deliver those Apple shares to your account until two days after the trade. And believe me, they make money on the interest while you, they, you don't have it, but they also have a ton of chaos to try to get those Apple shares into your account. Before 2017, not too long ago, it was T plus three, 72 hours after the trade. What you may not be aware is that next year, in six months, starting May 28, 2024, the United States and Canadian markets have announced, the regulators have announced, that all trades must now settle in T plus one, 24 hours after the trade. It's a huge change in six months. The entire financial industry is being impacted. Even though it sounds like it's just the United States and Canada, the United States and Canada are global markets. There's a global impact to the rest of the world. But there's another little detail. Don't be fooled. It's not really 24 hours. The trading day ends at 4 p.m. New York time. Then you have three hours to submit the trades and three more to affirm them. So you're looking at six hours total to get this all done. And you might all say, oh, okay, well, that sounds fine. There's another little detail, okay? If you watch the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange tickers, and you see those prices changing, okay? These big institutions in the B2B space, they're looking for the best price. So I want you to know that you can't put Gabino Roche, his address and account numbers and everything, to buy a million shares of Apple at this price and whatnot, because the machine that does the trades has to read every character, and it slows it down, because they're doing trades in nanoseconds. So the price can go from like one to another one in a huge blink of an eye, okay? So they want to do it quickly, so in order to execute quickly, they use these nickname short codes, it's like a five digit ID, it's like random, you have no idea what it means. They put it on there, they buy a million shares of Apple, and then they go through the post-trade processing, and then they try to figure it out. Now today you have 48 hours to kind of map it, but what you don't know is before you start trading, there are all these account IDs to settle the trades correctly. There's a global custodian account number, sub-custodian account number, you got your broker trading account number, your portfolio ID by the investment manager. You have the tax ID, the LEI, and much more. I don't have time to go through it all. 
But right now, you have this, this short code nickname that happens on the trade. And then afterwards, they're trying to figure it out on how to settle the trades. This is what Sapphire has been evangelizing for six and a half, almost seven years, is you do things correctly in pre-trade, you solve them in post-trade. So uh, you got those Apple shares that Gabino was just talking about. But do you really? No, you don't. Because the reality is, they don't know where to sell the trades. They don't know what accounts to map to. So let's take a personal example. You go to a local bank, and you open up uh, an account there. So you open up a personal checking account, a business checking account, a savings account. Those are three different accounts with three different uh, account numbers. Today, in a T plus two environment, these firms are doing a best guess or a guesstimate at which one to settle. So they'll put an account number to settle to, and then they wait to hear if you complain about it. You complain, say, that's the wrong one. Oh, sorry, guess again. They'll probably get, you know, get a better chance of guessing the next number, and then they leave it as a default. And maybe a week later, the business purpose changed. And it's a different account number, but that problem still exists. Can you believe this is the solution they have today? Yes, it exists in finance today. So um, these accounts, what they are known for inside of uh, finance is uh, called a, a thing, an acronym called SSIs. SSI stands for Standing Settlement Instructions. What are, uh, basically, what are the standing instructions to settle those trades in a given uh, trading day? Okay, think of them as the equivalent of, of your uh, routing and checking account number at the bottom of a check. And yet some firms believe that they need to work through authorized repositories of SSIs, have a huge volume of SSIs to work with to help settle those trades. You still run into the same issues. You don't know the business purpose. You don't know which ones are the right ones at any given per, uh, moment. And here's the kicker. Some of these firms have access to this authorized repository of SSIs through a login, and they can see the universe of all these SSIs in there, even with businesses they don't do any business with. Now, if this is the equivalent of your personal checking account, do you feel comfortable putting your personal checking account number in that rep authorized repository of SSIs? Probably not. So we at Sapphire have upped that standard to only allow specific trading relationships and business purposes to see the appropriate SSIs. So there are six authentication methods we actually employ, okay? And I think this is part of our solution because Sapphire provides all this in the cloud. And how do we get large, I'm talking the big name financial institutions out there. There have been many public press releases. For people who are new to Sapphire, in case you don't know, look at our press releases. You'll see JP Morgan, you'll see Citi, you'll see BNP Paribas, you'll see BlackRock and others, Franklin Templeton. They're all on the website. Those are all public press releases. So these are big institutions. How do they trust this technology? Well, these six authentication methods, especially in the case of SSIs, is what makes it unique for us. Five of them are, uh, at least three of the five, or three of the six, I should say, are common. The first one, any of you that work in a corporate institution should be familiar with the term single sign-on. So you get hired, you want access to the suite of applications like Microsoft Office and otherwise, they give you the single sign-on ID, you sign in one time, you have the full suite of access to their applications. You get fired, they turn off your single sign-on. They don't have to go to every application and turn you off. That can completely controls, uh, the, uh, gives them controls over you and your access. Second, something called multi-factor authentication. I believe everyone in this room is using LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or whatnot. If you log in, occasionally you'll get a multi-factor authentication uh, push notification via text message or some other uh, application. I think everyone's familiar with that. The third is something called IP whitelisting. IP stands for Internet Protocol, meaning unless you're physically at the office of your uh, company or you're using the VPN, the virtual private network at home, it does not matter if you get the right username or password, you will not get in, okay? The fourth is something called entitlements. Are you entitled to see standing settlement instructions at all? Because if it's not in your job description, you don't even get access. You can, there's no even, not even an option for you to access that information. If you do get access and you're entitled, the last bit is something called maker checker. So meaning if you gotta make an addition, a change, you made the change, but someone's gotta check your work, okay? So you gotta get another maybe four eye check. Two eye that does, the, the two eyes did the, uh, the, the, the update, the second pair of eyes make the check, but we also customize it. You could do six eye check, eight eye check, 10 eye checks, completely customizable by firm. Now that's great by itself, 
but Sapphire has one more unique authentication method, completely proprietary to us that no one else in the industry does, and this is where we establish trading relationships. So unless there's a trading relationship between two parties on those accounts, it does not matter even if you have the access code to the standing settlement instructions, they will not be visible to you. This again is only guaranteed through our technology, and again we make this available in the cloud. I was in this stage, or on this stage, I should say, uh, two years ago, evangelizing what Sapphire is about. And we were saying, guys, if you just did things in pre-trade, you don't have to take care of them during trading and post-trade. Now that we're moving to a T plus one environment, there's less time to prepare for that. So being ahead of the curve would behoove you as an industry to consider uh, a solution like that. Uh, but subject matter experts come around and say, you guys at Sapphire do not understand what is entailed in a post-trade. Think of these trades as a crash plane. It's in a million pieces. You need all these third-party companies collaborating together, the regulators coming in, everybody discussing how to piece that plane together to get it flying again and landing in its destination. I tell finance that they got it backwards. They are in the business of fixing crash planes, we're in the business of never having planes crash ever. I think we have a stellar business proposition. So today, but I would say, hold on, one more thing I would say oh, is that okay. the paradigm shift. Yeah, that's right. Because everybody is spending billions of dollars in post-trade, okay? There's armies of teams being created. You talk about decades of employees being hired there, okay? It's promotions, uh, third-party companies making money off of this. Some people want to keep it this way. But now with T plus one, there will be a reckoning. Disruption is coming to the industry. Yeah, there's plenty of money to be made when things are broken because you need someone to fix it all. And today we've been talking a lot about T plus two to T plus one. Why not T zero? Hence Sapphire's Project Zero. The whole concept is Six and a half, seven years ago, we've been telling firms, you should be working in a real-time environment. Real-time, not just in your internal operations, but with every one of your counterparties or clients. The industry has siloed themselves because they've gotten so big, they separate between trading, pre-trade activities, trading activities with the short code, nickname thing that I was telling you about before, to post-trade activities. And all the investments have been made primarily in trading and post-trade because that's where the money's to be made and the volume's to be addressed. That's where the perception was. It's just a cost of doing business, whatever is happening in pre-trade. This is where we got to focus. What we said from the beginning is, you do it from the point of inception. You apply AI patented technology onto this. You create memory around it and do it in pre-trade correctly. You could do your executions for best price with the little nickname short code, and then you automatically enrich post-trade. The firms working with us are seeing competitive advantages against their peers to be able to do this, but now given the regulatory demand and this clock, the six, six month clock that's coming up, firms can't just merely throw labor at it. Technology innovation is needed, in particular, patented AI powered cloud technology. And so what is the common theme that comes to every one of these FinTech live events that I, I attend? It's blockchain. Everybody asks the question, why isn't finance adopting blockchain? What is the gap to getting that to happen? And that's why we're excited to be here at this conference uh, today and tomorrow, is to talk with our fellow peers about how we at Sapphire are helping to bridge that gap. Think about about 20 years ago, when uh, Blu-ray and HD were coming out and everybody sat behind saying, which one's gonna be widely adopted? You know, which one should we use? That's the problem with some of the blockchain technologies today is that firms don't want to adopt one blockchain technology and then their counterparties are not adopting the same uh, platform. But if you do the intermediary step where you do what Gabino has talked about, this Rosetta Stone account mapping, allowing firms to keep their language and processes in place by having something translate this information between institutional firms in the cloud where everybody could see at the same time, then you layer the blockchain on top of it and it doesn't matter if you're on blockchain one, blockchain two, blockchain three, they're all interoperable because there is an account mapping to help translate that information. That's what's exciting about this technology today and that's why we're excited to attend FinTech Live this year. This is the future, guys. This is where we're going. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. We're happy to take questions and we'll see you out there. Thanks very much, we appreciate it.
Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Um, as they said, uh, there is a, a, a sponsor's booth upstairs on the next level, so level one, where you can ask uh, Gabino and Stephen any questions you might have about Sapphire's technology. But I've got some questions for you as well, actually. Um, to start things off, I mean, for people who aren't that familiar with you know, what you guys do, this all sounds great. But can you provide some specific examples, maybe, of how Sapphire's platform has directly helped partners that you work with? Yeah, um, well, it's, just, it's not just partners and clients, but we consider all our clients partners now as well, because we're helping change the industry standards. Um, but most recently, we had an announcement with the London Stock Exchange and their FX All platform. So we're integrating our technology, and they're even looking at considering white labeling the technology across their electronic platform system, FXOL, which is one of the widest, most widely used uh, FX uh, platforms out there. So um, this is going to help normalize uh, data structure and account structure, because everybody's been looking at the uh, economic details of components of all this, but the account mapping piece has been the core homework that nobody has undertaken. I have to give credit to my brother for helping invent some of the patents that we have created for that. So that's a great specific example. If you want to see that press release, it was done earlier this year. Um, and you know we have many great partners, just like the London Stock Exchange that we have mentioned in prior years at this event. I don't know. Yeah, yet. I just want to add one more thing. Uh, you know, for people in the room not familiar, and Stephen said it, FXOL is one of the premier FX trading platforms. But the stuff that we described before is morally, it mostly thought about as a middle and back office activity, not a front office. Front office is like the breadwinner. You make money for the company, okay? And so when you're trading, you're making money. And those folks on the sell and buy side, the banks and the investment manager uh, institutions, when they're trading on an FXOL platform, and you know that now Sapphire's technology is directly related to keeping all that account mapping done for you automatically. Now you're tying revenue activities to this middle and back office. That's what makes this significant because it's getting us wider adoption and wider attention. <clears throat> okay, now another question is obviously technology moves along at, a, at an alarming rate right now. So how are you ensuring that your platform is um, staying at the forefront of disruption when it comes to innovation? So it, uh, it's funny because when I started this career, <laughs> worked at big name institutions, all the names that everyone in this room should know, and you would think they're using cutting edge technology, but then we started seeing faxes, spreadsheets, mainframes, Windows 95, and I was like, what? I missed I us. This, yeah, I thought it was like, yeah. this was gonna be like Google and Facebook and whatnot. So not to be comfortable, we wanna stay ahead, but this is why Sapphire has 107 patents to date. We spend a lot on R&D, research and development consistently. We talk to our clients, a big thing we're employing right now is machine learning. All right, this is real AI, but this is not like Skynet from the Terminator movies, okay? This is, this is more of where you're reading a legal agreement and you're interpreting it. So I want you to know legal agreements are no different than reading a book, and people can write a paragraph different from one another. So these lawyers don't, are not consistent sometimes in their nomenclature, but we're now teaching AI to read uh, you know, a JP Morgan agreement from a city agreement from a Bank of America agreement and be able to consistently interpret it so that we can track terms. Because these agreements say, hey, if you drop, let's say, your net asset value in your fund by 20%, we terminate our trades with you. Well, now we taught AI to successfully extrapolate this from any document consistently, and now Sapphire can automate these compliance activities. So these are ways that we're staying ahead of the curve and not just sitting on our laurels. Okay, it's a good answer. Uh, so we've got time for. Thank you so much, Gabino and Stephen. Thank you. Thank guys. you very much. Thank you very much.